Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to be looking at this example that deals with angular velocity. So the problem states if an arm OA rotates with a constant clockwise angular velocity at one point radians per second, determine the force arm OA exerts on the smooth five pound cylinder B when the angle is 40 degrees. So one thing we can point out about this picture is that this ball or this cylinder was at some initial point over here probably and it moved up directly upward along the side of this triangle. So what we can say is that the distance from O to that cylinder is simply constant or four feet. So this length right here does not change with time. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually define a height. So right where the cylinder is right now, I'm going to define that as H. So this length right here is H. So I'm going to use this right triangle with, with the side length of H on this side to create an equation that maps out the acceleration of this cylinder. So let me create that right triangle. So it looks something like this, where this is the magnitude of R, this is H, this is a right angle, and this is going to be D, which is 4 feet. And right here, the angle between R and D is going to be theta or the angle at which the arm rotates. So what we can say is that D is constant because again, the cylinder only moves in the vertical direction and doesn't move to the side like this. So we could say that D equals R cosine of theta and this is constant. However, over time, the arm is right here or right here. So the value of H actually changes with time. So we could define H as well. So H is gonna be R sine of theta and this is not constant. Since R is in both of these equations, we could eliminate R and have H depend on the constant length D. So if we solve for R in this equation right here, what we're going to get is R equals D over cosine of theta. So I'm gonna plug this value into the H equation and then take some derivatives to find out the velocity and acceleration of the cylinder. So h is going to be d over cosine of theta times sine of theta. And if you simplify this using some definitions of trigonometry, we say d tangent of theta. So this value right here only maps out the distance the cylinder has traveled upward. So our goal with this equation is to find the acceleration of the cylinder. And simply the reason why we want to find the acceleration because we could relate that to the forces acting onto the cylinder by Newton's second law. So the most complicated thing with this is that we have to take time derivatives of h with respect to theta. So when we take the derivatives, we have to apply the chain rule since h is not dependent on time explicitly. So let's do the derivative of h with respect to time, and that's denoted by this dot above h. So d is a constant, so we can leave that alone. So we take d times the derivative of tangent, or the outside function, which is gonna be secant squared theta, and then we have to take the derivative of the inside function with respect to time, so that's gonna be theta dot. So to find acceleration, all we have to do is take the derivative of again with respect to time. And this is probably the most complicated part because it's easy to make errors when taking time derivatives implicitly. Okay, so to take the derivative of this, we have to do the product rule. So we're gonna do h double dot, which equals, d is still a constant, so I'm gonna move that out. And we have to take the derivative of this function with respect to time. So I'm gonna rewrite this a little bit. This is gonna be d secant theta squared times theta dot. So we have to take the derivative of this function, that's gonna be two secant theta times secant theta tangent theta, and then we multiply this whole thing by theta dot. So what I did, I did the power rule for the outside function, multiply that by secant theta, took the derivative of the inside function, which is secant, and that will be secant tangent theta, and then took the derivative of the inside function of secant, which is theta. So that's why we get theta dot at the end. And then to complete the product rule, we have to multiply it by another theta dot. Plus, now we have to take the derivative of this function with respect to time times the other function. So that'll be theta double dot times secant squared theta. So before I simplify this, um, let's note that theta double dot is zero, and that's because theta dot is constant. So if you take a derivative of something constant, that's going to just be zero which means this value does not matter. So this will all become zero. 
So I'm going to group these together and make it a little bit more presentable. So this is going to be h double dot 2d secant squared theta tangent theta times theta dot squared. Since we need the value of acceleration later, I'm just going to plug in the values now. So if we say h double dot is a function of theta and theta dot, then this is going to be h double dot when theta equals 40 degrees and when theta dot equals 1.5 radians per second. So the acceleration is simply going to be 17.159 feet per second squared. So this is just a diagram of the ball when the angle is 40 degrees. And we can say the acceleration or h double dot is directly upward because that is the motion of the ball. It can only accelerate upward. It is not curving to the right. It is not curving to the left. It is strictly just moving up the wall. So I'm going to do some force analysis on this. So we could treat this as a particle. So we could say this is a, the ball. There's going to be a force on the ball directly to the left of it. And that's being applied by this normal force by the wall. So I'm going to call that FW. And then perpendicular to the arm, there's going to be another force acting in that direction. And I'm going to call that FOA. And lastly, the cylinder has a weight which is directly going downward. And that's going to be W. So I'm going to draw the resultant force in this blue dashed line. This is not actually part of the free body diagram per se. This is just the resultant force, which is MA. So when you add up all these vectors, it's going to have a resultant force directly upward. So I'm going to define this coordinate system in this direction, X and Y. And let's try to apply some angles to this diagram. So that is the arm respect to this horizontal axis. So then this angle right here is theta. Therefore, this angle between FOA and W is also theta, and FW acts to the left of it in the horizontal direction. So by Newton's second law, we can say that the sum of the forces in the Y direction, which is up is positive, is going to equal FOA times the cosine of theta minus W, and that's going to equal the mass of the ball times the acceleration upward. And then just for clarification, we didn't need this force actually to solve this problem. But since the particle or the cylinder is not actually moving left to right, we could say that the sum of the forces in the x direction where right is positive is going to be FOA sine of theta minus FW, and that's going to equal zero. So then we could say that FW is simply FOA sine of theta, or just the horizontal component of FOA which makes sense. So we don't really need to, need to know this, but I just want to put that out there just for completeness. So our goal is to find FOA. So if we do FOA cosine of theta equals MA plus the W or the weight, we're going to get FOA equals MA plus W divided by the cosine of theta. So if we plug in some values, this is what we're going to get. We're in the US customary unit system. So that means our gravity is in terms of feet per second squared. So gravity is going to be 32.2 feet per second squared. So the mass of the ball, so it weighs five pounds and we have to divide by gravity, which is going to be 32.2. That'll give us the mass of the ball in terms of slugs. And the acceleration as we solved earlier is going to be 17.159 feet per second squared plus the weight of the ball which is 5 and divided by the cosine of the angle which is 40 degrees. So then FOA is simply 10.005 pounds. So let me quickly recap on what we just did. So the first thing we notice is that this length right here is constant and that the ball or the cylinder moves directly upward only. So when we find a relationship with H or how the height changes with time, we could actually make it dependent on this distance of four feet. So that's what we did. We created a right triangle, which is the same as this right triangle right here. And then we found the relationship between D and R and H and R and in terms of the angle. Although we don't know the magnitude of R, we can get rid of R and have 
H depends strictly on D and the angle, which is what we did over here. Since our goal is to find the normal force of the arm, our goal is to find the acceleration so we could relate that to Newton's second law. So to do that, we took this equation of H and took time derivatives to find the acceleration when the angle is 40 degrees. And we also recognize that it's rotating at a constant angular velocity. So when we get this equation over here, we could ignore this part of the equation because this assumes that the angular velocity is changing with time. And again, it is constant, so this is not going to be a value in our equation. And this is probably the trickiest part of the problem because you have to take the derivative using the product rule as well as the chain rule. And this is probably where most of the mistakes are made. So when you see this function right here, secant squared, it's really a function within a function within another function, which makes you do not only the product rule with theta dot, but also the chain rule twice. And that's why you get this equation right here. So just be very careful when you do this. So then we plug in the values of theta and theta dot. So we, did, we create an equation of h double dot in terms of theta and theta dot. We plugged in the values and got 17.159 feet per second squared. And then we're gonna use this in our force analysis. So I drew a little diagram of what's going on. So the net acceleration is strictly in the upward direction because the cylinder doesn't go in this direction or this direction. It doesn't move anywhere towards the left or right. It strictly moves upward. And then we just applied the free body diagram of this particle. We could assume it's a particle and we could assume it's not rotating. It's just simply sliding up against the surface. So we have a force due to the wall and then a force due to the arm being acting on the ball. And then finally, there's a force of gravity because the cylinder or ball has some mass. So that's what we did right here. And we recognize that the arm itself has an angle relative to a horizontal axis. So what we can do is actually create a right triangle and recognize that this is just an inclined plane. And we can say that this angle right here is also theta. And then we defined our axes in this orientation. You do not have to define your axes in this orientation. It is up to you how you want to define it. But I think for simplicity, it is easier to just do it in this way since the net acceleration is directly upward. And then we use Newton's second law in the y and x direction as indicated right here. So the sum of the forces in the y direction is going to have a net acceleration. However, the sum of the forces in the x direction have zero acceleration because again, the cylinder is not moving to the left or to the right. It's strictly moving upward. So if there was an acceleration in the x direction, this ball would have to curve or curve in this direction. And then we recognize that in the problem, all, our goal is just to find FOA, so we don't really need this equation right here because this equation just allows you to create a relationship with FOA and the sine of angle. So from there, we just use this equation and then solve for FOA. So that's what we got right here. So this is the equation for FOA. Plugged in some values, and the normal force of the arm onto the cylinder is going to be 10 pounds. So hopefully that was clear. We will go through more examples, not as easy as this one, with actual particles rotating with time so we can actually get more into the polar coordinates of things. With that being said, I'll see you in the next video.